Hey everyone, this is Chris and Sandy Bent with the Chris and Sandy Show. We get up close and personal with some amazing guests throughout the entertainment industry. And today, like I say on every episode, we have a great one for you. Who do we have? We have Kevin Mambo with us today. He can currently be seen on the new Netflix drama Hit and Run. The series tells the story of a man searching for the truth behind his wife's death who becomes caught up in a dangerous web of secrets. He is a two-time daytime Emmy winner from his leading role on the long-running soap opera Guiding Light. And he's also been in Cadillac Records, Law and Order, Law and Order Criminal Intent, Law and Order SVU, The Blacklist, and many more. And we're excited to have him on. So welcome yes, to the show. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You know, everybody's in a tough time right now, last 18 months with COVID and all oh, that. Yes. So how has COVID affected you and what have you done to kind of maneuver through this? Because I think it's great for people to hear this. Right. Um, COVID has been quite difficult. Um, I've lost a lot of friends to no. COVID. A um, lot of family, but a lot of close friends. Mm -hmm. I got it early on when we were starting to figure out what was going on sort of um, okay. early last March. I was sick for about six weeks. I mean, wow. I had never, wow. I had never been so ill, and I was still in Brooklyn. So you had near the, the hospital, <laughs> yeah. And we were sort of in the hospitals in Brooklyn, you know, uh, trying to figure out what was going on. But you knew if you yeah. went to the hospital, you weren't coming out. And they had started mm -hmm. bringing trucks. It, it was just wow. kind of an ominous time. But I was fortunate <laughs> enough; I didn't have to go to the hospital. But it was weeks upon weeks upon weeks. And then after that, you know. You do go through long-term symptoms. I had brain fog for a long time. Mm, Couldn't wow. remember anything. I uh, went one, two, three, seven. Wait, one, two, seven. When you couldn't formulate thoughts. Came with a lot of fatigue. But um, you know, being patient through the the summer and the following year. Once I got well, um, before COVID hit, I had been invited to join what well, even before I mentioned that I'm working on a film now I mean I can't discuss the name of it but we have had our schedule affected by COVID as well it, it's wow. very difficult to have you know actors crew members producers fluidly coming in and out and trying to maintain a schedule but now you have to have quarantines so there's time involved so I I, I really commend to everyone who's trying to to keep production going at a time like this, it's very difficult. I can't imagine how expensive it is to get insurance. How are you going to house people? You know, we've had to, um, we've created some very strict, strict daily protocols on set. And even with that, people are still getting sick. Um, so it's it's very difficult. Yeah, I think I read in, in the Times yesterday that uh, Chicago had to close again, another couple of shows. So, you know, even wow. New York big shows are, go are going, this is a consideration. You're doing a, a, a show of that scale. You're talking about at least 300 professionals in the building every day before right. you're even considering, mm -hmm. before you're even considering your audience or even some of the day staff. So it, yeah. it does take a yeah. lot of people. So between Delta and Omicron, we're going to see, I, um, was asked to join a company a few years ago um, called Greatest Stories Never Told. And it was about um, plays and educational works for kids about some of the things that are not discussed in the history books. Katie Payne, how uh, she mm -hmm. discovered that elephants speak subsonically. Um, and we, oh, wow. I came in to do rewrites for The Flying Hobos about the first two African-American men who flew across the country in 32. Mm -hmm. In terms of Manning, okay. and um, to follow that story um, first as a playwright, and then to add music as a composer, I ended up directing, and thought, what an amazingly rich story. And mm -hmm. as we go mm -hmm. through it, we are actually starting to meet all the people who were some of the people who were involved. Some of the schools where um, Banning went to school. Um, uh, our researcher Pat Smith found his manuscripts in the attic of um, a small library in Oklahoma. So we thought, oh, wow. what great stories to come and tell kids and put them together. And we mm -hmm. we put them in a show and the show was touring, yeah. getting great responses yeah. from schools. Mm -hmm. you know, we're, we're still building a catalog, then COVID hit. So we had, to, I was working in the theater doing some remote kind of workshops, similar to this format, but yeah. we were adding mm -hmm. more light sound and digital elements and lighting elements. 
um, to be controlled from one brain in one city and people were all over the world. And it was a great lesson for me from how to, to how to shift digitally for the next little while. So we developed a show digitally. And I think one of our audiences last year was uh, 150,000 100, 150, kids. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. And, and, you know, I so think the, that this time is actually a learning experience where I think that, you know, because digital has always been here. Yeah. But I think this experience is going to help us figure out how to combine the face-to-face -face with digital and then we get the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely right. Um, I am Anyone who knows me will tell you that I love technology, but as soon as I touch something, it goes on the fritz. <laughs> but I've always been um, a fan of digital and multimedia, be it um, uh, a multimedia dance theater, but just being able to have that third and fourth dimension with an audience. So I was primed to really learn how to, yeah. how, to how to do this. And, you know, we, it's the, it's the mother of invention, right? I mean, we all mm -hmm. wouldn't have been thrust into a form formats like this, where we can yeah. continue to yeah. connect no matter where we were. And, Unless we got proficient, we weren't going to get proficient until we had. To. Now, thank God this didn't happen like 10 years ago because the right. technology was not there. It wasn't there. Yes. It's <clears throat> kicking the COVID, right? Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so, you know, a lot of people would ask, when did you know you wanted to become an actor? But I like to go deeper that. When did it click that this could be a career move for you? I started acting um, in high school. Casually, I was actually a musician, really. I grew up studying and playing jazz. That was kind of my first thing. Um, law school was going to be my other thing. I I went to a boarding school for the last two years of high school where I was you know, learning, meeting new folks, learning new stuff. I was managing to play. We had a, a jazz group at the school, but it just at that moment really wasn't enough. And there was sort of enough tension between me and the band leader. And so I, I thought I'd, mm, I'd join the school play <laughs> and then book the lead. And I had no clue how I was going to handle it. Um, and so I started to borrow music vocabulary for stage. This is the thing that I knew first. And that was like my first foray. We got to college and realized that outside of spending time at jazz clubs, I was auditioning for plays all the time. Wow. So I, I, I was at... Um, McGill University and dropped a pen in my class in an amphitheater class and I bent down and picked it up and that gave me an opportunity to kind of check out the room and I was mm -hmm. just I, I, I at that moment I realized that I wasn't in the right place <laughs> I enjoyed the people I enjoyed the subject matter I think I would have made a good attorney but I knew that I wasn't going to be the person reading briefs at four in the morning and enjoying it. Uh, yeah. I was going to be the person on set trying to solve a pyrotechnical problem <laughs> at four in the morning. And that wasn't going to bother me one bit or being in yeah. tech for the next 20. And that's so important. That you and that, that, that told me that, you know, that that's as difficult as the jobs were going to be. Mm -hmm. I knew that that would be actually harder than the work. <laughs> yeah. And that's so important that you came to that conclusion because a lot of times um, people in college, um, their parents, their friends, their guidance counselors will push them one way because that's where the money's at. And then later in life, they're miserable. They're, they're unhappy. They never that followed path. that path. Mm -hmm. They knew in their gut they weren't supposed to right. be there, but they did right. it anyway. And that's so great when you see people like you who says, you know what? This ain't me. Mm -hmm. Right. I, it, it, it takes a lot. And, you know, I remember a couple of Christmases with like three cans of tuna, one for me and one for each cat. Like, you know, you do go through stuff. But um, at the end of the day, I would rather be looking back on some of the stuff that I had done and not, you know, missing the things that I hadn't done. Yep. That's, that's, a, that's, actually, a, that's a large chasm of time that you can't get back. That's not a four year reset, right? That's, yep. your, right. that's your root down. That's your root down. At least and you know, a that's while. a perfect segue into mm -hmm. my next part. As you know, as a lot as you know, a lot of people they see the actors like yourself, the glory behind it, but they don't see the grind, the sacrifice, the tears, the struggles it takes, not just to get the high level, but even a career level within entertainment. And I always want to talk about that side of it because I think that many people gloss over this. They think if I got the talent, 
I can make it. And we both know it's a lot more than that. So tell us about some of the sacrifices. I know you just said one of them, but some of the sacrifices mm -hmm. that you have to, had to make to get to where you are today. Well, there's, there's a, you know, you, it's one of those things where you, you, you're living only so far. I mean, the great gift that we can always give ourselves would be planning and time management. Mm -hmm. But if you're constantly auditioning for work, you can only plan so far. So that means you're not really going to get the house. We're probably not getting engaged for a long while. You know, all of the practical things um, kind of get thrown out the window yeah. for a long time mm -hmm. when you're in a chamber. I remember watching an interview with Carol Burnett, who's one of my favorite comedians, and she said, people do not understand the amount of sacrifice you have to make mm -hmm. just to get to where you think you wanted to get. And I never believed that. I never believed that until, you know, I started working on this, I started getting old and I was like, yeah, there's plenty of things. This is why I, I want to talk to do. about it. Buy a house, mm -hmm. have kids yet, you know, it's the things you want to start doing in like your late twenties, early thirties. And mm -hmm. unless you found, you found that um, amazing Broadway job or even that, you know, TV series that lasts you four or five, six years that at least gives you financial stability. It's very hard mm -hmm. to, um, to think about those futures. And then of course, societally, that future is tied to your worth. Yeah. So yeah. it's like, well, you're really amazing. Once like, well, check out my credit and you should see, you know, what my car looks like, or even, even working, I think in, in, in the wings, um, you always want to, particularly as a guy, at least at some point play a really great detective. And I've done all of the law and orders, I think, except for one, the new, <laughs> new, new one and the one that was uh, that came with the attorneys. So uh, I managed to, okay. through my through the years, yeah. kind of guest spot on all of them. And then uh, hit and run, got to have my own gun, my own badge. Yeah. Um, and that's even that's even more grueling because those are the actors who are out under a bridge in January by the water <laughs> for eight hours. And Ooh. poor people are laying in front of you, and they're trying not to tremble because they're laying on the ground. They're supposed to be dead. Can't get <laughs> shot because the, because the corpses are moving. I mean, yeah. it's it's a lot of moving parts. It's a lot, a lot, a lot. But uh, you know, being able to do things like greatest no stories never told. Uh, when I was doing the Guiding Light, I would go to Cincinnati to host the Image Maker Awards. No oh, wow. And I, I would oh, tell them, you know, you don't have to pay me to come. And it's the Image Maker Awards uh, is a community award from Procter & Gamble. So it's where people were really making an impact in the community year to year. And I think the first year I was there was, uh, 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 wasn't Luther Vandross. Maybe Luther Vandross came to sing, but they try to pack, you know, some celebrities in, give the people of the community something to, to see, but also, you know, something to celebrate. And I said, those are the kind of things I would do all the time anyway. for free <laughs> in order to you know if you if you're a, if it's free to be a galvanizing point why not that you, and, and, you know, use and, a, a career of you know of it's funny to, we to talk it with enough some. people that it's like you do all the work at the beginning and then as time goes you're less needed but yet you're making more money so that makes it's crazy the way the world works ain't it and two, when you're, you know, when you're young and full of vinegar, you're like, I'll do it. Three bucks, I'll do it. In fact, three bucks, I'll do all of it. And then the person who's been in the business 40 years says, go ahead, young buck, I'll sit back here. And bring me a water on your way back. Yes. <laughs> you learn as you go. You learn as you go. Yeah, so what are some sources of inspiration for you? Um... I've been a musician pretty much my whole life. So I, oh, I draw I draw a lot of inspiration for music, for writing, for directing. It's just a very natural and baseline place for me to um, to be. I've got my, my best friend and I, we've been best friends for almost 30 years. For over 30 years. We met at jazz camp. Wow. <laughs> that kind of kid. Uh, Doing cold, yeah. cold train at 8 in the morning. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I draw inspiration too from um, from art. I'm a big Kane okay. Wally fan. I'm just a big visual art fan. I'm a big fan of even just um, 
geometry. I spend time with a geometry book or photography book for hours and hours. I just love symmetry and math and shapes and those kinds of things. Um, I'm a big foodie. I love to cook and I love mm. to eat almost as much as I love to cook. Um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> what did I do for Thanksgiving this year? Eight. <laughs> eight, eight stuffed quail. Ooh, yeah. Mm. Yes. Stuff with the mushrooms and wild rice and Ooh, very nice. sliced kielbasa kind of thing and, and roasted and grilled that. Um, so yeah, yeah, food. And I also um was very inspired by um my mom, very, very hardworking human. Oh, and her yeah. and my folks came from I was born in Zimbabwe, immigrated to Canada several years later. And mm -hmm. just to one of those people who just led by example. Wow. You know, once once everything stopped, she stopped talking. She was, you know, raising two boys, going to school oh, wow. full time, going to work full time. Get, <coughs> excuse me, getting your degrees done, mm -hmm. getting it done. <coughs> so to see where we had come from mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. where we were, I wow. felt that it was definitely incumbent upon me to kick the the, the rock that much further down the road. Oh, wow. Love that. Mm -hmm. And what would you like for your legacy to be as an actor? What would you like to be most known and remembered for? That's a hard one. <laughs> um, I've, I've had an opportunity to play in some really amazing pieces of art. I, we, I was in the original cast of Ruin with Lynn Nottage, and mm -hmm. we got to tell the world about the war in the Congo. Oh, wow. And we got to bring yeah. that charter back to the UN mm -hmm. on the floor and speak on the floor about it and uh, raise money for the women who were being um, raped and ravaged in the Congolese mm -hmm. war. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a yeah. doctor, Dr. Ponzi, he had his own hospital. And we, from coming off stage with our buckets in our hands, raised you know tens of thousands of dollars to send to him for this hospital. Wow. Oh, that's amazing. And being a, I played uh, Fela Kuti as well, the Nigerian mm -hmm. Applebee composer and activist on Broadway and on um, a leg of the tour which we took back to Nigeria. And to see how um, the spirit of his activism and just direct speak against, um, you know, injustice and government injustice and social mm -hmm. injustice to be able to come to back to the root where he came from and look yeah. Yeah. and what he's still looking at. And both of his sons have um, their own bands. Femi does uh, his eldest and his youngest. Um, Shaylin is a good friend of mine, has the original band, Egypt 80. They come to town, I play with them when they're in New York. But to see them in the context of still living their own history. Um, mm -hmm. And like I was saying with Linfrey, to be, part of the actual context of hip history for people to really connect that which was to that which will be. I think for me is that it's the biggest thing is, it was as, as a musician, because yeah. the context mm -hmm. was always jazz. So the context was always yeah. a bunch of dead guys who I never knew anyway. So we were always sort of pulling from the past and synthesizing and, and that synthesis to me is kind of the most exciting thing. Love that. Yeah. So tell us how you got the role on Guiding Light. Tell us about how that went. <laughs> I'm a very funny story. <laughs> Excuse me. I was going to school at USC. I was in my senior, senior year. It was uh, coming into the last semesters of school. And prior to spring break, I had gone into audition at CBS, they were looking for someone for the role. And we auditioned with Betty Ray, God bless her soul, who cast so many people on that show. She was mm -hmm. an amazing mm -hmm. woman, an amazing casting director, but could also a really great like actor. She could connect with you in an audition as if nothing else in the universe was happening. Oh, wow. And it was really, could just give that of herself, really. Um, I went and read with her um, at CBS. I lived a few blocks from there. And mm -hmm. I'm now involved in this love scene, you know, this is 20, 22 year old kid and a 77 year old woman, uh, you know, five foot two white woman who are involved yeah. in this really hypercritical, beautiful love scene. It was really funny, but special. <laughs> and um, 
the audition happened. Um, then over spring break, as all my friends were going off on, you know, fun filled vacations over abroad and I was staying in, in California, I got a phone call. They said they want to see you for a screen test in New York. Oh, wow. Tomorrow. Okay. So just pack away. We'll go yeah. overnight and just you'll go and come back. When they call, you go. Yeah. Yep. It, it happens that fast. Um, so I went, auditioned, and I'll never forget that the cameraman, one of the guys who ended up becoming a great friend later, sort of over everybody's shoulder, gave me one of these. You know? uh, okay. So I walked yeah. out thinking, yeah, 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 yeah. You always do. <laughs> Came back to the Californian. They, they they called. He's great, um, but he's just too young for the role. Wow. So he needs oh. to be intern, doctor kind of thing. You know, five six years from now. And mm -hmm. then they called back a few weeks later and said, "We, he's too young for the role, but we want to use him anyway. Oh, we'll okay. put him on contract when he gets out of school." Mm -hmm. And that, the the thing any actor wants to hear coming out oh, of school. Wow. So I, I knew I had the job thing out of school. I could start studying the show as part of my last semester's work, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And then um, I got a call from our producer, and she said, you know, we really we uh, love your work, but we just are not sure how to use you. And mm -hmm. I think in, at that time in soaps, too, a lot of um, uh, EPs changed shares. And so shows start to look a little different, goals are a little different, writing's a little yeah. different, that sort of thing. And um, I said, well, I'm I'm from Africa and grew up in Canada, I speak French. Mm -hmm. I could um, be from Europe and I'm a saxophonist, I would be a jazz musician from Europe. Ah, oh, And they were like, I'm gonna pass that to the writing team. That sounds really good, actually. <laughs> that's sort of how I was, that's, yeah. that's sort of you how I was born. You created your role. Yeah. yeah. And so the nice thing was it, it really allowed me to, to slip in as opposed mm -hmm. to think I was taking something on. It was already me in a way. So I managed to just. And isn't that in. the best way? You know, we've we've interviewed a lot of actors and actresses and um and the ones that play the role, because I've asked a lot of them, is the role you? Because, you know, of course, a lot of times it's not. Yeah, but, sometimes but, but, it's but, but the ones that say, very similar. oh, this was me all the way. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can tell the, the energy, the joy that they have in that because they right. get to play themselves, basically. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I went on stage to play <laughs> fella, and my best friend said, so you're playing Afro jazz, dancing, talking, acting, playing the food. You're basically playing yourself in dialect. <laughs> it's helping me. It helps me get the first half of things done for sure. Yeah. For sure, for sure. It's different Definitely. too, I think, uh, for, for me anyway, it's different in different mediums. If, if it's a music thing, it's very natural. It's very, mm -hmm. music is very much what it says it is, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, if you, if I'm working on camera, I also have to remember that there's so much else working <coughs> that I have a lot less work to do. Mm -hmm. There's lighting, there's DPs, there's cameras. You don't hear it. There's music somewhere at the end of it in post. There's a whole bunch of other things happening, so you don't have to work so hard. It's when you're on stage where you have to help make sure that things have enough enough energy, but you know that it's not. You have to measure your size a little more. So I, yeah. I find yeah. each each one for me to be a little bit different, and I have to remember on the day where I am. Mm -hmm. So what's been your hardest <laughs> role to play? Gosh. Um. Thela was my most demanding role. Um, it was physically demanding. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. essentially kind of like a $20 million one-man show. We had scenes, but mm -hmm. he it, it's a, a long-running monologue for two hours. Um, and that, when I finished working on Ruined, um, I had put weight on for Ruined. I was playing the commander of the army. So I wanted this guy to walk on stage and just be full of size and just <laughs> gravity and just be imposing without having to flex in any way. Nice with polished shoes, nice polished gun, mm. biceps, and you just you knew who he was. Um, and psychologically, that like, gets difficult to do every night because yeah. you, yeah. you are the the place that's the dark part for, for the journey of this story together. 
Um, and then to play Philad, which came next, I had to, I stripped off 50 pounds wow. in, Ooh, wow. in 40 some days, mm. just Ooh. under two months. So that meant working out every day, running every day. My diet had changed. It, I meant rehearsals in the day for that, but I was in the show at Ruined at night. And <clears throat> that meant a weight schedule, a dance schedule, mm -hmm. dialect schedule, history schedule, music wow. rehearsal schedule. Wow. And then we had, you know, a, a schedule too of stuff where we sat and talked about, you know, culture at Nigeria, culture at that time, that contextual stuff. So it was just a busy, really busy time. And my day for that show started about four hours before the show. I wow. would, mm. I would were I would I would uh, run first. I'd run Central Park <clears throat> with headphones on and do the whole show. And then I would go to the gym and then I would go to my dressing room and get ready to do the show. So it turns into you know, a five, six, seven hour day. And when the gentleman who was splitting the role with San Gaja, who originated the role off Broadway, he went off to the West End to do a London run. I took over Broadway by myself. We were doing it alternating because mm -hmm. it was pretty tough, but I made a commitment mm -hmm. to do eight shows a week. Wow. And that, that was that was hard. By the time I was done, I was 143 pounds. <clears throat> And just yeah. craving a hamburger, craving Now, hamburger. this might not be the same, but that's like with <laughs> us, with um, this show. We launched the show January of 2020. Okay. And, you know, our original plan was 100 interviews first year. Mm -hmm. We thought that would be great doing yeah. that. Then, of course, COVID happens. And we're like, you right. know what? We're all in now. And right. because of that, we're at almost 500 interviews now. So we're like doing them all the time. Yes. Love that's it. a commitment because <laughs> I know there are some days and other days. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, there, there, yeah. You know, there are some days you're like looking at the schedule. You're like, can I cancel? No, I can't. Again, you don't, this. you don't feel good. You don't feel, you feel bad. And, yeah, and it's not, perfect. again, you know, you look and you're like, you know what? I don't care who they are. It's coming on. I want to give every person me. As much as I can, yes, you know, because they just they all of the our guests deserve that. They so do. we get on and do our right. thing, and I and it's funny because sometimes what I've noticed is the ones where at the very in the middle earlier in the day where I feel like I don't feel like doing this come out to be some of the best ones. They always right. do. There's nothing like getting out of your own way, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Because again, it's so you know, and again, like you know, this when you do something every day, it can sometimes can become a rut, and then you start getting worn out. And then, and what then I do like sudden, though about what we're doing in entertainment, um, in in most of the facets, right, is that mm -hmm. even if, and this was what I was I was talking to um, my my mom about with years ago, even if. I, every time I get a job, it's always going to be different. Every time I meet someone in an interview, it's always going to be fresh. Yeah. The hard thing will be to be in a track on a long running show, you know, on the long running stage show yeah. and really make those exact same words real and true and, and that exact same yeah. emo, you know discovery real and true every time for me mm -hmm. that's what's always been crazy hard so when i go into a, a film or a television show or a new show i'm excited oh, in that mm -hmm. no matter what it's gonna be new that's like what that, part is, that part yeah. is taken care of yeah i had to yeah. get up at 2 30 i haven't had anything to eat like all the other stuff is wrong but this part is this part is fresh. Yeah, that that's is like fresh. with us, each guest that we call, we never know what, what direction the show is going to go. That's true. You know, I've got right. a base we set of questions I ask most stories. people. Mm -hmm. But but again, sometimes I don't get to any of the questions because they take me in another direction that I, that I never imagined. And I love that because that, that's what keeps our show fresh, even though there it are does. moments to where I'm like, I feel like I'm in a rut. But then once right. I get on the show, it's like, oh, it's this is time, awesome. Man. You know, <laughs> we get to do this. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> Someone was born for the stage. They send it. <laughs> <laughs> like, I remember our very first interview, January 3rd, 2020. Um, we had two interviews that day. And we started out as a country music um, interview show. And it what, evolved. And it evolved to what it is today, where it's entertainment and all together. Mm -hmm. But I remember getting off of that interview and I told Sandy, 
I was like, you know, this is it. This is what we're supposed to do. I just knew it at that point. And we've been all in since. That's great. I, you guys can take over. For, well, they're done now, right? Crook and Chase. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have an old episode that I did for them years ago. Oh, wow. I, I'll have to chase it down. And I was standing oh, on the spot yes. where, where they um, I was playing ball, standing on the spot where Elvis uh, recorded Heartbreak Hotel. Oh, because wow. wow. that was a that was a old recording studio that they turned yeah. into their own personal TV spot. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow, that's, that's way awesome. back. That's way back. Yes, I remember <laughs> watching them on TV. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Now, as you know, a lot of people they see you as the actor, but they don't see the team behind you. In our opinion, teams never they get the don't. love they deserve. So take a few moments to tell us about the team that helps you be who you are. Um, I have wonderful team um, at over at KMR. My manager, um, <coughs> excuse me, Jason Kashiwagi and his team there have just been um, absolutely amazing. There's, you know, if you're an actor, you are not, it is not incumbent upon your team to push you, but mm -hmm. it is the most helpful when your team yeah. is behind you and pushing you. And it is most, most helpful when they don't mind if you fall down a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> Hello, Cats PR. Or if you're behind on schedule or yeah, if we you're love sick cats. and you're trying yeah. to, to rearrange all that stuff. You know, on the face of it, it looks like, oh my God, you're so crazy. But behind, behind you, there's 75 different things happening and there's life and there's family mm -hmm. stuff. Um, I was always one of those people that enjoyed working in music and songwriting and enjoyed working in the theater just because they're so immediately collaborative wow. and I love working with other people. Um, so I always find that it's unfair when, when an actor takes a hit for a bad movie. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Not his fault. Yeah. Or her, her fault. fault. There's, right. there's 500 people around trying to make that movie together. And I do enjoy mm -hmm. the art of filmmaking collaboratively, working with the DP. And you just never off. know now, where the public's going to be on a movie. You just never know. Yeah. You don't. I, I've seen some stuff that I thought was amazing that my friends have made that have been panned, seen some other things that were okay that you just don't, you know, <laughs> taste is taste. Mm -hmm. Everybody's. Everyone's tastes are different, but so true. Um, I really enjoy working in these mediums and I, it's harder for me. I've been doing more writing lately, a lot more writing. And that has been the harder part. And it's because writing is really such a lonely job, <laughs> mm -hmm. wow. you know, until the point you get to collaboration or you get to your editor. It's a really, <laughs> it's, it's a really, 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 really a lonely job. You know, <laughs> speaking of teams, we have a third cohort, so a yes, little nine-year-old. Yes, we do. Oh, yes. Let me allow him I'll to ask him. a few questions. So Sandy's going to go get him. And we've yeah, got a two, sure. we got a two-and-a-half-year-old da daughter that when she gets older, she'll be plugged into the show, too. Because we are a family <laughs> affair here. Apparently, this is what I was going to say. <laughs> this is a family affair. Got to keep it in the family, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing more powerful than a family that works together. I absolutely agree. And I have been really, really, really happy with my family. That is awesome. <laughs> They've really, really been doing great for me. And I, we really work well as a team. I'm really happy about that. And family's not always blood. Well, yeah, I think it's about half and half, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Kevin. So what's the very so I just wanted to finish off by saying thank you to my people at A&R and at Bold Management Productions. Awesome. So Even what's your favorite plug. food? What's my favorite what? Uh, what's your favorite food? My favorite food? Shellfish. I like mm. scallops, clams, crawfish, oysters. I think I might be allergic to oysters. I was a few years ago. I'm hoping that that ends. But I love <laughs> seafood and particularly shellfish. What about you? Mine is pizza. Pizza? Yeah? With what yeah. on it? Uh, pepperoni, sausage, Jean Supreme. She's got three faves. Yeah, yeah well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of on the sausage team myself. Uh, okay. I got sausage, <laughs> sausage, red onion, a little bit of mushroom. Yeah. Yeah. What's the favorite TV show? 
I have different favorite TV shows. I'm getting old. Like I watch the news a lot. Um, I have been. What have I been watching lately? The truth is, the stuff that I'm enjoying watching right now, you're way, way, way too young. <laughs> and if I give you the names, I know you're gonna go look them up, and then I'm gonna get in trouble. I know how this works. I'm, yeah, yeah, I've been your age. I know this works. Yeah, he would. <laughs> he would. Yeah, sure. And yours? Mine is is SpongeBob. SpongeBob. SpongeBob's a funny show. Yeah. And it's, and you know it's been cool because he watches a lot of the Nick, Nickelodeon Disney shows, so we've been able mm -hmm. to bring because of this show a lot of the actor and actresses from his shows onto our show. Oh, that's great. So that's been cool for him to ask a few questions to them that he looks up to. All right. So what's the favorite movie? Well, I think my favorite movie is Trading Places. Uh -huh. It was one of my favorite movies as a kid, and it's still one of my favorite movies now. It never gets old. And now that I'm a little older... I recognize a lot of my friends who are in it that I didn't know then. So it's kind of cool to watch them in a movie that I loved since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And yours? Mine's the Minions movie. <laughs> the Minions movie? Yeah. <laughs> That's really good animation. Yes. You know, they have built a really great brand with all the Despicable Me's and the Minions. Yeah, I, I tell you. Really and, and it's like, you know, our two and a half year old, if we're walking in the mall and there's a Minion in the store, we have to go in. Oh wow! So, so they've really built a crate, a really strong, <laughs> bright brain. yellow, real bright yellow, really works. Oh, that too, the bright, <laughs> the, the brightness too. How smart! Right? Was, whoever does their marketing should be should be rich. It's pretty genius. It probably is. <laughs> Bye, thanks. You got it. Have a good day. Now, he loves being on the show and and all that, and we've had him on 98 percent of the oh, time. Yeah. So please. So, um, if you could co-star with any actor or actress, who would it be and what role would you want to play? See, that's a very, that is almost the kind of question that an actor doesn't say. Because if you could <laughs> co-star with any of the handful of your faves, you probably would get tongue-tied and might not co-star with them again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm working with some good dramatic actors right now. Can't say who they are. And also working with some great comedic actors. Okay. And it's been a really good lesson. I studied improv comedy, uh, mm -hmm. improv comedy in college. And it's a really good lesson to me in terms of we always make the assumption that there is the most weight in the drama. But if we look at comedy, comedy isn't funny unless there's real stakes, right? Or real yeah. weight. Yeah. So you break down a comedy scene and sort of take the laughs out. It's usually a, a much heavier scene than some of the dramas that I do. Oh, Between wow. that and the timing and just, you know, if you're working not on stage but in, in a, on a film thing, because there's always a mixture it, of truth in comedy. Mm -hmm. Always, always, and and you you find that the the nugget of truth that makes people laugh is that really deep thing that the comedy is covering. Mm -hmm. I just played um a, a Dutch. We just won a sh award for a short I was in with some good friends of mine, um, written directed by Timothy Naylor, and. <coughs> A good friend of mine, <coughs> excuse me, Leroy is playing. Um, I'm playing Quasimodo. Oh, okay. And, and Leroy's playing my um, my agent, mm -hmm. and it's done in black and white. And he's got a great sort of presence in terms of like a, a real film noir presence. And our short essentially is Quasimodo trying to get a job. Oh, wow. And he's trying, he's working so hard to work. Yeah. He wants to get a job. And and our makeup artists were actually amazing. I'll get you guys some of it. Like, they built these big prosthetic hands. Mm -hmm. And one of my eyes is, like, slid over to the side. I mean, they did a real, yeah. a real Quasimodo um, makeup thing. 
it's hilarious because um, Leroy McLean is playing the agent and he's just trying to get me into another henchman job. Okay. Yeah. And I'm trying to do anything, even working in the typing pool, like anything oh, wow. that doesn't have to do with henchmen. So right. when you take the comedy out and we, and we, you know, I won a couple of awards for the film. When you take that, that element of it out, that's really a very sad story. Right. <laughs> so we know why the, the Steve Martins and, and, um, and some other, the Jim Carrey's, et cetera, mm -hmm. can tend to be quite depressed, right? Right. Um, I've been watching, a, what have I been watching <laughs> lately? A lot mm -hmm. of um, Denzel again, a lot of Michael Shannon, um, a lot of Regina King, a lot mm -hmm. of Meryl Streep all the time. Um, John uh, Cazal, John Cazal is, is my favorite. I just thought he was, by the time we had that, he was just amazing. From the Dog Day Afternoon, uh, he was he was engaged to Meryl Streep when they met Shakespeare in the Park. Mm -hmm. Cassavetes. I've been watching a lot of trying to watch a lot of well paced, uh, slower paced, well written things. I think that that is harder to do. Yeah. Watch a lot. Yeah. I watch. I ter I also watch terrible movies on purpose. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'm one of those guys. Uh, you make you feel better. Probably, Probably yeah. the biggest Nicolas Cage fan ever for that reason. Oh, and, and tell and tell him my other favorite movie is Raising Arizona. Um, wow. So I, I love him at his best and his, at his worst in terms right. of the productions. Not, not that he's just driving the movie in terms of the productions. And I think mm -hmm. that in, in terms of trying to be a student of my craft, both things are good. Because honestly, some things I see, are, they're brilliant and I just get lost and I forget the lesson. Mm -hmm. Then I gotta go back. <laughs> yeah. So as we come to a close here, if you had a friend of yours and they feel called to act, what advice would you give that person to kind of help guide them the next few years? I would say the things that you are endeavoring to do or you want to do, you haven't done. So that's not the issue. The issue is being able to be uncomfortable enough to figure out how to get it done. Mm -hmm. So to be able to persevere and push through is not fun, but it is necessary. So I would tell them that part of the thing would be, um, what's the old, the old adage? Uh, if you want to be a writer, write. But anything that you are doing is just going to be in the in the execution of it, in the action of it. And making the mistakes is a huge part of it. So yeah, that's right. include that into the lesson. You got to so fall, just to, fall forward. You know, as long as I, I tell my students, not the falling down, it's the getting up, you know. Mm. But if you learn from the lesson, then you are not going to go back to that place again. And that's growth. So, you know, mm -hmm. growth ain't pretty, but... <laughs> Let it happen. If it stays ugly, it well, you know, whatever, whatever anybody yes, else has to say about you, that's that's their business. What you're trying mm -hmm. to do is your business. Love that. Yeah. And on that note, you know, <laughs> tell everybody how they can find you and what and yes. what you're promoting right now. Yeah, uh, you perfect. can find me um, on Facebook. You can find me on, on Insta at I am Mambo. And right now we are still um, pushing our great show Hit and Run. Uh, oh, it yeah. is on Netflix. It is a mm -hmm. fantastic international crime show. Um, our director and DP also came from Handmaid's Tale. It has a very beautiful, lush kind of noir look. Our uh, Sonal Lathan is in it. Um, Lior Seged um, is writer and producer on it. Um, Greg Henry is also in it. It's a fantastic cast. I had a whole ton of fun once I got Long John's doing it. Um, we got COVIDed, so I don't know if we're getting reshuffled, but it was an amazing experience. And uh, when the new movie's ready to go, I'll be back. Oh, love that it. sounds great. We'd love to have you back anytime. You got it. Thank you so much for having we me. We enjoyed this. We so did. This was fun. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for your Thank time you today. Bye. Bye.